one of the great challenges of leadership is that almost everyone believes they can do it better. It's so tempting, so satisfying to look on at people in leadership positions, particularly those on a national or international stage, and critique. It's very Australian, almost like our national guilty pleasure. We love to pick leaders apart. And perhaps in some cases it's fair enough. Our news is full of headlines at the moment about corruption and misdemeanour and war. The behaviour of some leaders is appalling. I must admit, when I heard recently of a former world leader in his 70s throwing his lunch against a wall in a fit of rage, I had to roll my eyes. Even my nephew, who's not quite three, is able to conduct himself better than that. And yet, people in leadership operate under, often sorry, operate under intense pressure in situations far more complex than we could ever imagine, having to make decision after decision that would keep most of us up at night, all the while bearing the weight of crippling expectation on their shoulders. Mr Albanese, for example, carries the myriad and often conflicting expectations of some 26 million Australians. How on earth is he meant to keep any of us happy? Talk about mission impossible. If we were to stop and think about it, perhaps most of us are really glad that we don't bear that kind of responsibility in real life. But have you ever wondered if, say, just for one day, you were Prime Minister, what you would do, what you would change, what you would implement? Or maybe on a larger scale, if you had the power and the influence and the means, how would you improve the world? Maybe you would tackle poverty, protect the environment, address crime and corruption. It can be fun to daydream about, can't it? If you were to rule the world, if you were king of everything, what would you do? What would your agenda be? And in one sense, this is what the book of Acts is all about. It's about the agenda of the king. As Steve mentioned last week, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are a bit like part one and part two of the same work. The Gospel's intention was to provide the reader, Theophilus, with assurance or certainty that Jesus was indeed the fulfilment of Old Testament prophecies and promises. Jesus was the Messiah, the promised king in the line of David who would establish God's kingdom. And the Gospel of Luke does just that. It records in incredible detail the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, confirming him as God's Messiah, the chosen eternal king. But the question Theophilus must have asked when he came to the end of Luke's Gospel was, what next? The reign of Jesus had been established, but what happens next? How would his reign be extended? How would God's kingdom spread? What was the king's agenda now? And that's where Acts steps in. The whole book is about the extension of Jesus' reign, about him working out his agenda in the world, and our passage this morning sums it up for us beautifully. Acts 1, 1 to 11 gives us the mission statement, if you like, that governs the rest of the book and indeed the rest of this chapter of salvation history of which we too are a part. And Jesus' agenda is simple. The gospel is to go to the ends of the earth. The gospel, that is the message of the salvation that is available through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. The salvation that is available to all who would repent of their sin and believe in him is to be taken throughout the world. The first thing to notice about God's ongoing work in the world is that it is based entirely on Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Verse 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach 
until the day he was taken up to heaven. The Gospel of Luke, part one, if you like, is all about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And this sets up a a very clear expectation that Acts, part two, will be about what Jesus continues to do and to teach. So although Jesus has ascended into heaven, although he is now at the right hand of the Father in glory, Luke assures the reader that Jesus is very much active and involved in the continuing establishment of God's kingdom through the spread of the gospel. There are times in Acts where we see Jesus at work directly. For example, when he meets Paul on the road to Damascus. But most often he's at work indirectly, in the power of his spirit, through his people. His word is going forth and lives are being changed as people hear the gospel and come to faith in Jesus. And it is Jesus who is behind it all. In Acts 2, for example, we're told that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's a beautiful thing, really, isn't it? That Jesus is very present. He is very involved, very much still at work in the world, achieving his purposes. And his ongoing work is achieved in the power of the Holy Spirit. From verse 3, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And down in verse 8 we read, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. At the start of Jesus' public ministry, when he was baptised by John, we see the Spirit of God descend upon him and remain on him. As he preached and teach, taught, as he healed and he cast out demons, he did so in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he promises his followers that when he ascended to heaven, he would send the Holy Spirit to them, to dwell in them and to empower them in their ongoing mission in his name. The Holy Spirit would be their counsellor, comforter, leader and guide, their helper, the teacher who would remind the disciples of all that Jesus spoke, the one who applies the scriptures to the hearts and minds of his followers today. The Holy Spirit is the one who testifies about Jesus and empowers believers to do likewise. The one who seeks above all the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son. And Jesus tells his apostles, wait for him. This new age, this new chapter in salvation history, the extension of God's kingdom would happen in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it would be in the Holy Spirit's power that Jesus' disciples would witness to him. Verse 8 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus here is speaking to the 11 remaining disciples. These were the men who lived with Jesus for three years during the course of his public ministry They ate with him, they travelled with him, they saw all that he did and all that he taught. They were with him the night that he was arrested. They saw him crucified. They saw him die. They saw him be buried. And these were the ones whom Jesus appeared to following his resurrection. 
Can you imagine the awe and wonder the disciples must have felt seeing their Lord before them, spending time with him, hearing him speak over those 40 days? At the end of Luke's Gospel, we get a glimpse into some of Jesus' teaching during this time. From Luke 24, Jesus said to them, This is what I've told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Just to see their friend and teacher back from the dead would have been life-changing. To hear him explain how he was the fulfilment of the scriptures, even more so. To be called to witness to him in the power of the Holy Spirit. How absolutely remarkable. How humbling. Their job now, their purpose, their agenda was to speak of Jesus, to point to him, to point to Jesus' life, death and resurrection, to the salvation that he achieved through his work on the cross, available to all who would repent of their sin and believe in him. A task so simple in some ways and yet so profound in the power of his spirit, to be his witnesses. And not just to their neighbour, not just in their hometowns, but to the ends of the earth, in verse 8. The gospel was going global. This was the king's agenda. And we're so familiar with this that perhaps we lose some of the, the shock, some of the surprise... Not only were the disciples to witness to Jesus throughout Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, territories once thought of as Israel, but throughout all the world. Meaning they were to witness not just to Jews, not just to their own people, but to Gentiles as well. There was no greater dividing wall to the Jews in the day. Ephesians 2 calls it the dividing wall of hostility. Jew and Gentile did not mix. And yet in God's provident wisdom, his kingdom would include all who would believe in him, whether Jew or Gentile. And this had always been God's plan. Isaiah 49, for example, God speaks of Jesus, his chosen servant, saying, it is too small a thing for you to be my, for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. It was God's agenda that the gospel, this message of salvation through Jesus, be taken to all people, regardless of ethnicity, religion, language, skin colour, that all who believe in him might have life in his name. God's people would no longer be defined by ethnicity, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And it was the disciples, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who would begin witnessing to Jesus in Jerusalem and beyond. And so God would extend his kingdom in the power of the Spirit through the witness of his disciples throughout the world. This was the agenda of the king, the risen, exalted Lord Jesus. Now before we come to think about what this might mean for us today, there are a couple more things to point out, and these have to do with what Jesus' agenda is not. Firstly, it's not about meeting human expectations or desires. In other words, it's not about our agenda. 
In verse 6, we see the disciples ask Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Despite the time they'd spent with Jesus hearing about the kingdom of God, learning of God's salvation planned for the world, the disciples were still concerned with their nation, with their people Israel. And perhaps we can sympathise. They were, after all, a people under foreign rule. Though they had many freedoms under the Romans to practise the Jewish way of life, they were still ultimately under the Romans. Of course they wanted the kingdom of Israel restored. Of course they wanted to be politically self-determining, to be autonomous. But Jesus gently draws their attention back to where it should be. And that is the bigger picture of what God is doing in the world. God is concerned with reconciling sinners to himself. He's concerned with the gospel spreading, with the message of salvation through Jesus Christ being taken to the ends of the earth, with establishing a kingdom far greater than one defined by land or politics, a kingdom that will endure forever, containing people of every tribe and nation and tongue. This was to be the focus of the disciples. This was to be their agenda also. It was towards this end, the extension of God's kingdom, that they were called to labour. Their agenda was to be God's agenda. As Jesus' disciples, they were to set aside their own desires and expectations, to leave these things in God's hands, to trust in his sovereign wisdom, and to fully get on board with Jesus' mission in the world. The second thing that Jesus' agenda does not involve is being passive, being flat-footed, if you like. From verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. It must have been a very difficult moment for the disciples. Jesus was, after all, their, their leader, the one they looked up to and took instruction from. It must have been very disarming to watch him ascend and disappear from view, to no longer be with them physically. There must have been so many different thoughts and emotions going through their hearts and their minds as they watched on. But they had a task to do. Why are you standing here looking up into the sky? The angels question. See, Jesus would return at the God-appointed time, a time which only the Father knows, which 2,000 years on has still not come to pass. No amount of staring up into the heavens, no amount of longing, no amount of flat-footed inertia will bring Jesus back before the time that the Father has ordained. And Jesus had given the disciples a job, a task to do. At that moment, it was to return to Jerusalem and to wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on them. And then, empowered by the Spirit, it was to witness to Jesus wherever he led them. The disciples longed for Jesus to return, yes, but they were not to abandon or neglect the mission that he had given them. They were not to rest on their laurels, eyes on the heavens, idly waiting for his return. They were to stick to Jesus' agenda. And it's the same for us. Our Lord has not yet returned. We live in the same chapter of salvation history that the disciples did, and Jesus' agenda remains unchanged. As his followers, as Christians, our agenda, our purpose, our life mission should be his, to witness to him in the power of the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth. 
to tell people of the salvation that is only found in Jesus, to be salt and light in the world, to live lives that point to Jesus, to proclaim him as Lord and Saviour until our dying breath. And this will look different for each one of us. Just as in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit lead Jesus' disciples in different directions, with different tasks to do in the kingdom. So too he leads all of us in different paths as we commit our lives to Jesus' agenda. For some, the Spirit may lead us into overseas mission work, proclaiming Jesus in places far from home. Did you know that according to the Joshua Project, over 42% of the world's people groups are classed as unreached by the gospel message? That one quarter of the world's population live in places where there is no opportunity to hear about Jesus. And that only 1% of the world's missionaries go to these places. It makes you think, doesn't it? For some, the Spirit may lead us into vocational ministry, paid ministry, proclaiming Jesus in, in schools, churches, sporting clubs, homeless shelters, in the outback. For some, the Spirit may lead us to witness in our front lines, those places where we work, where we live, where we socialise, where we shop, where we volunteer. As we go about our daily lives, whatever format they may take, we can and should be seeking the Spirit's guidance in providing and utilising opportunities to witness to Jesus in both our words and our deeds. For those of us who may be unwell or frail or in stages of life that limit us, we can commit to praying. Pray for the gospel to go forward to those who've never heard of Jesus. Pray that God would continue to raise up workers for the mission field and for vocational ministry. Pray that God would embolden Christians everywhere to conform to Jesus' agenda, to witness to our risen King. We can pray for the lost. Pray for those who are persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. There is a role for each one of us in God's kingdom if we say we follow Jesus, his agenda becomes ours. None of us are to sit back idly, staring into the sky, passively waiting, flat-footed. None of us are to prioritise our own agendas, our own preferences, our own desires, whether that be comfort or worldly progress or wealth, security, whatever it may be. None of us are to prioritise that above the agenda of our risen King. If we call ourselves Christians, our agenda is to be his agenda. But are we willing to pray those dangerous prayers to be used by him, to give our lives over to him, to be sent by him, to allow him to work through us to extend his kingdom as he sees fit? And so today, and as we continue to look at this fantastic book, can I encourage us all to be seeking the Lord, to be seeking his guidance and direction, to be seeking his help in conforming our agenda to his, to be seeking to give our lives to him, to be used as he wills in the extension of his kingdom, and seeking to witness to Jesus in word and deed, all the days of our lives. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you. We praise you for your Son, Jesus, who has provided the way for a fallen world to be reconciled to you. We praise you for your grace and mercy that you have reached out to each one of us and drawn us into your family. We praise you for the forgiveness and salvation that is ours through Jesus. And we praise you, Father, that you continue to extend your kingdom, that your gospel continues to go forth in the power of your spirit 
through the witness of your saints. Father, even today we pray that all over the world many would hear the gospel message proclaimed and come to saving faith in Jesus. We pray that you would soften hearts, open eyes and grant faith to many living in darkness. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to raise up men and women as workers in your harvest field, both near and far. We pray for ourselves too, that we would willingly place our lives into your hands to be used in the extension of your kingdom. Help us, Father, to conform our will, our agenda to yours. Lead us and guide us, Father, as we seek to witness to you. Empower us by your spirit. And we pray too that you would unify us in purpose, that our eyes would not stray from you, that we would be striving to build one another up in faith and forever seeking to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.